shy. I don't shy away from it. Um, I, I really wanted to tell that kind of story, um, uh, but in, in a way that was framed for adults, including things that, that adults know. Uh, you know, as a fantasy fan within the fantasy um, you know universe, I was always very obsessed with that side of things, basically the C.S. Lewis side of things. Not so much the epic, um, uh, the epic Tolkien, you know, uh, uh, huge continental war side of things. I was more interested in kids discovering their power, discovering secret worlds. Um, and mostly when people write fantasy for adults, they work the Tolkien side of the street. And what I wondered was, would it be possible to write a story um, like that kind of story, uh, a story about um, the kinds of stories that, that, that C.S. Lewis told, or Le Guin or Rowling, but tell that for adults. So put in all the stuff that, that they leave out, put in all the sex, all the violence, all the horror, all the depression and confusion and, 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 and sadness and boredom uh, and drinking and sex and all that stuff. <laughs> Would it be possible to tell that story? Um, and, uh, you know, the, when, when I read, the book that I read that, that, that launched me was, was Susanna Clarke's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Having read that, I thought, um, uh, you know, that I had to, I had to sort of, I had to sort of try to do that because doing anything else, um, it just seemed so urgent that, that somebody tried to do that because I wanted to read that book so badly. Honestly, that bit, that's, that cement segment in New York, it, it just, I tried to work this out very carefully, almost like a thought experiment. What would really happen if, 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 if uh, a young man went to a college for magic in America? And, I think, key point, upon graduating, he found out that there was no Voldemort, uh, there was no Sauron, there was no primary antagonist um, in the universe for him to go off and fight. What would happen? It seemed just, it seemed merely honest to send him to New York and then proceed, have him proceed to, to fuck around and waste his time and waste his energy and his power and his magic. Um, just doing all, uh, doing fuck all, just, um, you know, drinking and, and going to dinner parties uh, and just wasting his time because I feel like that's what, that's what would happen. Uh, and I wanted it to be, of course, a bit of a shock, um, but, but not, not, I think, um, gratuitously so. By the way, those, the New York section used to be like, you know, five times as long, and uh, uh, it turned into this one, this epic sort of pub crawl, and eventually I just kind of put <laughs> down to one dinner party, it seemed like. I don't think there is anyone. I don't think there is a, a, a moral center or a grounding to them. Um, I, I, I tend to feel like, like novels aren't really about moral centers, or at least not currently. They're more about disturbing the idea of moral centers, um, taking moral centers and shifting them off center, or pitting incompatible moral centers against each other. I mean, I think, you know, toward the end, it becomes, the book becomes a little bit about, for lack of better words, psychological health or a willingness to confront the fact that there is no... Um, there are no easy moral answers, um, but that's as much as I'm willing to cop to. Um, well, speaking of uh, I, your mom thinks that Quentin commits suicide. Is that correct? You... Mom. Another thing I read. Yeah, that's not disturbing to me at all, though. I mean, that doesn't make me feel uncomfortable that my mother assumed that this character who represents me. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I come from a weird family. Uh, uh, um, my, uh, well, just a very. My parents are extremely literary. My, they were they were before they retired. Both English professors. Um, my mother wrote a novel, and um, my father's written many books of poetry. So they are um, very. Um, they 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 are very aggressive readers. They 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 you know when they read something they have a take and they have um, you know they have their little interpretation they like to put on it. Um, and so uh, that was my mom's. Um, and I like to think that that echo is there, but it's 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 you know it's a tertiary or quaternary echo. It's not it's not what actually happens. You know, we'll learn we'll we'll return from the Netherlands and learn learn a lot more about about their nature. Um, I think uh, I, I worry that it, you know there you could get a little bit too sort of cute and Borgesian and sort of Jasper Ford about it. Um, if it turned out that, you know, literally every, every novel or every fantasy novel um, that had been written uh, was real, 
So, you know, I have a feeling like with everything, you know, some of them are true and some of them are true but very corrupted, and some of them are just bullshit. <laughs> Teletubbies, though, that's real. <laughs> We're going to get into that. Nice. Um, leads in to my question was, I mean, the obvious cliffhanger of the book is, what is Quentin's discipline uh, for me? And that I kept waiting for it to come out, waiting for it to come out. So, when you were initially writing the book, you did not have a discipline for Quentin and you were okay with, with that and just kind of leaving it open-ended? And if not, if you have an idea of what his discipline entails, I mean, come on. You know. <laughs> Help a brother out. Listen, you guys have been a great audience. Uh, <laughs> uh, looks like we're at... Um, yeah, well, well, like I said, writers, uh, readers like closure and writers hate, hate closure. Um, and there's a strong impulse in, in, in most writers, certainly in me, to leave certain threads unresolved. If you uh, cast your eyes over the Amazon reviews for my last novel, Codex, I learned a harsh lesson about how much ambiguity readers are prepared to tolerate. Just search for the word, you know, crap or ripoff or whatever <laughs> among those Amazon reviews. You'll find them. Because uh, I left the, the ending somewhat uh, of that book somewhat ambiguous. Um, so I try hard to discipline myself and tie up threads, but that one, I didn't tie off. Um, so I'm afraid uh, we're just going to have to leave it for the sequel. You will find out, but um, fuck. I mean, if I told you now, why would you buy the sequel? Um, so thank you for doing this chat with us. We're back. Now, but this brings up a point. Are you affected? I, I would like an honest answer. As, are you affected by these reviews? I, I, do you read your reviews? Do you read your negative reviews on Amazon? And, and do you then, are you, have you changed anything based on maybe misconceptions or any, you know, maybe you read something that people wrote about the magicians and you're like, oh, I better change that in the sequel or, or, or clarify that. Has your writing changed at all based on reviews from fans or from critics? You know, it's funny, my therapist asked me the same question. <laughs> Is he there? You can lie down on the couch if you want. Um, you asked for the honest answer, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I have. I, I am a, I'm a really firm believer in, um, in the, um, that, that when, that people writing novels are in the entertainment business. And, um, they, it, it, they are, it is, it is, it is fine for them to put anything across that they would like to in their novels, but, um, uh, they can't be boring or, or annoying when they do it, um, otherwise what's the point? So, um, I have a really hard time with online reviews, um, I find them, you know, they, uh, people tend to be quite disinhibited uh, when they're online and they like to make categorical, categorical statements, not me of course, I would never do that. But they like to make categorical <laughs> statements that are unqualified. So, you know, you will find somebody saying, you know, Lev Grossman should never be allowed to touch a keyboard again. There should be a law passed that he cannot ever write anything anymore, even in the privacy of his home. He's that shit of a writer. You can actually find that. It's on BarnesandNoble.com. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's a certain amount of diminishing returns. And God knows, when you're trying, when you're sitting in that room, you know, trying to write the first chapters of a new novel, you feel like that's enough of a dickhead as it is, without the help of people online, you know, chanting that you are a dickhead. So there is a limit to how much of that stuff I can take. That said, however, I mean, it's an incredible resource for any writer, and I do, I, I read as many of the Amazon reviews as I could stand, um, and I feel like I took as much constructive stuff as I could take from them. Um, for example, uh, what would be an example? Uh, I'm interested in the problem of Quentin's likability. Did anybody out there, I can't hear you very well, so someone has to relay the answer, did anybody out there think that Quentin was too much of a twat? Yeah. Oops, yeah, there are a lot of people who thought it was a twat. Yeah. But too much of a twat. Or too much of a twat or just the right amount of twat? Too much. There's a few people that said he was too much twat and love who said just the right amount of twat. And that's, and that's what great. Uh, Alright, so it is. Really wants to talk about twats.